Good morning. You should all be commended for coming here first thing in the morning after I hear some tequila parties last night. So um, I have been in security for a long time and in AppSec for some time too. Um, some of you may remember, I actually keynoted AppSec Conference USA in 2010. And so it's, it's kind of fun to come back. And of course, the community has grown so much. So it's great to see so many people here. Um, in 2010, I talked about this concept. At the time, everybody was like, I don't know what she's talking about. But you have to ask Jeff Williams. Years later, Jeff Williams' company built this thing, and which was what I talked about in 2010. Now it became RASP and IAST. So today, I'm going to talk about the concept of digital trust and the impact of application security in this era when artificial intelligence is everywhere. So we'll start with a little bit of history, then look forward. Can anybody tell me what this picture is? Yes, ARPANET. This is the very first version of ARPANET. This is the very first time four different computers in four different places were connected together. It's 1969, and it was before I was born. Um, so the computer in UCL, uh, UC Santa Barbara, I think at the time, right? that's right, um, was trying to send the very first message. They're trying to test if the TCP IP was working. Uh, the very first message uh, Santa Barbara machine was trying to send to the SRI machine is login, L-O-G-I-N. And back then, you know, it was the very first time testing. So uh, the person sitting in Santa Barbara would type L, and they're on the phone too. The SRI guy would say, yeah, I got the L. And he would send O, yeah, I got the O. And then what? The SI machine crashed. So, in fact, the very first message the internet ever sent was low. And it's actually not just that, because after an hour, they reset the machine, and so the Santa Barbara um, guy started sending the whole logging again. So after LO, what's the next letter? It was L. So in fact, the very first three characters the internet ever sent was LOL. <laughs> so the internet is here to make fun of us all along. Now, back then, there were only four machines. You know exactly who was online, which machine you're talking to. Trust in that world was easy. And then 1970, MIT, BBN on the East Coast were connected. And this is 1977. We see that Washington DC is connected, Illinois is connected, Hawaii and London is connected. And these are just sites. And this is the picture of all the machines by 1977 were connected on um, what was called ARPANET and became later the internet. So at 1977, it's already difficult to enumerate all the machines and enumerate all the users that's connected in this network. So at that time, trust, just being virtual, being in this network, is already a little bit difficult to assess. So today, we have over 4 billion IP addresses on the internet. And, and with IPv6, we will have a lot more. So trust is an entire different ballgame today than it was back in 1969 and 1970s. So how do we assess trust? To talk about trust, we, we first have to understand what we mean by trust. Right? In the digital world, what constitutes trust? So 
when I put my academic hat on, trust is really an evaluation of a predicate, right? So it is asking the question, is this trusted? And what is this? This is typically a multi sort of a dimensional evaluation predicate. It's identity, it's the interaction, it is potentially the machine, the device, the time of the day, the location, all kinds of context information that goes into the evaluation of this predicate. And those of us who study computer science, we know at the end of evaluating a predicate, you want to say yes or no, right? So the yes is, okay, this operation can go forward or this action can go forward. No is we're not going forward. So this, in this context, yes is, yes, this is trusted. No, it's not trusted. It's fairly black and white um, scenario because in, in real situations, not black and white, but in this particular case, whether the operation goes forward or not is a black and white scenario. So what does this mean? In, and so think about an operation can be between two services, can be service to service, can be user to service. And for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to focus on user to service. And service to service is fairly similar with, with a little bit different nuances. So who is trusting whom? The user wants to know that he or she is interacting with a service that is trusted or trusted by her or him. And the service wants to know that it is interacting with a user that is a human and the human that the service is authorized to do business with. So this is high level what trust is about. Now let's talk a little bit about users trusting service. If you see this pop up on your screen, would you buy stock with this? Probably not, right? But in the early days of the internet, uh, maybe not. So today, Something about this website gives us visual cues that our brain processes and say, hey, not trusted. But what about this? This is actually a screenshot of an Apple phishing site. Without looking at URL, just looking at the visual, can you say this is Apple or not Apple? The visual cues are not that clear. And what about this one? This one is actually, I took it uh, three days ago, a screenshot of the, uh, I think it's a national Australian, Australian bank. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and that's the URL on top. Even the URL, the URL looks a little suspicious, but if you're not in security, if you're not a, a digital native, you look at this, it's hard to tell whether this is a legitimate site or not. So what that means is there are certain visual cues that we process, and some of them pres are present in the services that we interact with, but not all the time. So how does human brain, how does a human brain process visual cues and arrive to a decision of trust versus not trusted. So I got interested in this question a few years ago. I started studying um, some of the neuroscience literature. And what's interesting is in the neuroscience studies, um, there has not been a definitive region of the brain that is associated with the decision of trusting something or trusting someone. But it is definitely, there is a region in the brain that is associated with distrust. And that region is actually am amygda uh, amygdala. Uh, it's a little hard to pronounce that word. 
And some of you may, may have heard of what amygdala is. It is a little sort of almond-shaped ball of uh, brain tissue, very densely packed brain tissue that is embedded in sort of a kind of deep under um, the human brain there. And there's one on the right side, there's one on the left side. Amygdala is the part of the brain that processes, processes survival instinct, in most strong emotions, fear, and apparently now, according to the literature, distrust. So if you see something on the screen that you do not trust, absolutely do not trust, amygdala lights up when they study in the neuroscience way. Um, so amygdala is interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit larger in male than female, but they process emotions, so it's kind of hard it's kind of interesting to, to, to know this fact and to know that male actually have a hard time processing emotion. <laughs> but it's interesting to look at neuroscience literature and understand how we arrive to trust decisions physiologically, right? Um, even though we don't have a definitive understanding of which region of the brain processes trust, there are advances in neuroscience which studies online visual cues to understand how we process warning signals, so how we process trust signals, such as if you have, have a green bar on top of the browser that um, indicates extended verification certificate, does that lead to trust? These literatures exist. This is interesting, but I want to switch gear a little bit to talk about how services trust users. Right, so we want to know, the service want to know if I'm interacting with this user or this user. So how do we typically today, from the service standpoint, arrive to a trust decision? Um, it's, as you would guess, a question of authentication. And authentication has many different ways that you can approach an authentication decision. One of the methods is actually fairly static, does not involve a lot of inaction, is biometrics. Um, facial recognition is one of the methods. Now, I don't know if you guys know what the uh, market average accuracy is for facial recognition. Does anybody know? No. The, what you want to have is the accuracy is above 98%. But in uh, larger data set tests today, state of art is about, it's a little below 90%. So it's actually not quite there. And, but it's getting better. So I actually did some tests. We found sets of uh, uh, similar looking portraits. And in 2017, it, it's a pretty easy test um, if you can find good data sets. So I did this test. I used both Amazon and Google Cloud facial recognition to see if there are any mismatch. And so an example is the test picture was mismatched to two of these female pictures, not her. Um, in 2017, these two services both had fairly high mismatch rate. 32% pictures were mismatched for Amazon, 24 were mismatched for Google. Now, this is, this is just for the particular data set, right? It, it, when you broaden it up, the, uh, <clears throat> when you broaden up, the stats probably get better. And I used the same data set to test earlier this year, and it has gone, the mismatch rate has gone down. So the algorithms are getting better, getting more accurate, but still not 100%. Has anybody read this article by ACLU um, about two months ago? ACLU did this test, they took the pictures of all the members of the US Congress. How many are there? Test for you. 
How many members in the US Congress? Oh, you pass. 535. It's, it's both the House and the Senate. 535 pictures. And then they took a database of um, criminals' portraits. There are about 10,000 of them, I think 15,000. And then they run through Amazon's facial matching algorithm. So they found 28 members of the US Congress were mismatched to pictures in the criminal database. 28, right? 28 out of 535, what, that's 5%. 5% mismatch. And one thing is interesting is in the 535 members, about 20% um, are men and women of color. In the mismatched set, 39% were men and women of color. So what does that mean? That means the algorithm performs poorly for people of color. And if you trace back to, to see how the algorithm works, is because the training data, they had less training data for people of color than they had for Caucasian. Another two examples that some of you might have heard. Uh, this article just came out about Amazon a few days ago. Um, so apparently since 2014, Amazon have been using, has been using an AI algorithm to screen uh, resumes. Right? So they get probably tens of thousand resumes. And so the AI algorithm will screen them first, and only the ones past the AI algorithm will get to actual human reviewed. So what they found was the algorithm was decidedly biased against women. If you put on your resume any kind of information that indicates you are a woman, either your name or you participated, say, in women's soccer, it will put you in the discard pile, or has a high probability putting you in the discard pile. And Amazon discovered this, and uh, um, I think they tried to tweak the algorithms, in the end decided to scrap it all together, not using it. Another case that came out was written in MIT Technology Review in 2015, um, is that I think that has since been uh, amended quite a bit, is back in 2015, if you search for a particular kind of jobs or, or a, a keywords for jobs, if you're a registered Google user, if you're a woman, the list of jobs come up will be of lower rank than if you are a guy. So the algorithm feeds you thinks you qualify for a lower ranked job if you're a woman. Why? Because the training data says that. In the training data, women are, the population of women holds the type of position tends to be a little lower in terms of ranking than men. So the question then, there's a debate in the artificial intelligence community is, has the algorithm done anything wrong? Should we fix it? What do you think? There is a camp said, no, the algorithm hasn't done anything wrong. It's acting accurately based on the training data. And you will not be wrong in saying that. But on the other hand, is this the outcome that we want? Shouldn't we change the training data? You can say that in the uh, case of jobs, maybe there are different sets of training data that you can use. But in other problem arena, maybe the training data or unbiased training data isn't there. How do we fix the problem? Do we find different training data or do we change the algorithm? It's an interesting question to ask because 
maybe you shouldn't be changing the algorithm. And how much do you tweak the algorithm to the favor of certain population? And that's a very interesting, not only technological, but also ethical question to ask. And my question for you is who should be looking at this problem? Is this an application security problem? Some of you would say no. Right? When AI algorithm makes maybe a perceived mistake or perceived bias, is it our job to fix the algorithm errors or bias? Is it? Or maybe not. Is it our job only focus on SQL injections and cross-site scripting? Then I will ask you, does it matter to work on SQL injection and cross-site scripting when the application produces results that cannot be trusted in the first place? Shouldn't we be working on an application that can produce trustworthy results first? Whose job is it if it's not application security? Whose job is it to enable or ensure trust in this AI world, right? So, speaking more of trust, has anybody heard of this concept, heart rate variability? Yes, one person there. <laughs> um, so everybody knows what heart rate is. Heart rate variability is the, the physiological variation of the, the time when the peak of the heart rate to the next peak of the heart rate to the next peak of heart rate. And in normal healthy human being, uh, you don't, your heart don't beat in the exact same interval. There's some variation there. And, and sometimes it's, it's usually down to the hundreds of seconds or thousands of seconds. Um, there's an interesting set of literature in health, in bioscience today is linking heart rate variability to a whole bunch of diseases. Okay? So if you have, if your heart rate variability is reduced, meaning that you have less variation, it actually is an indicator, a good indicator of certain kinds of diseases, including if you have a cardiac transplant your heart rate variability will be very different than a normal, a healthy human being who has not had a transplant. Now, uh, heart rate variability is actually a very um, difficult data to get. It requires um, uh, precision equipment like uh, electronic cardiogram, right? And it's not something that somebody can just listen and get it because it requires precision. So it requires equipment to be on this person to extract this information. Or does it? What I'm gonna show you is a video of a company that I'm looking at that is producing an artificial intelligence algorithm that can extract heart rate variability from a video of a person without any equipment attached to the person. So this video is going to show you, so the algorithm, what the algorithm does first is process, takes a video and does a facial recognition, say, okay, this is the region of the face, and you'll probably see a, a yellow dot around the face. Then it focuses on two regions on the cheeks that you see the, uh, the, the is that square or rectangular to blue and red? So it turns out every time your heart beats, um, the blood flow behind your face changes a little bit, and that changes the light reflection in the slightest way. A good AI algorithm that tuned to look for that kind of signal can pick up the exact moment when your heart beats by processing the light reflection of your face. So I'm going to show you a video that shows this person is wearing an oximeter, which uh, produces the, the actual reading of the heart rate 
and, and you can see the heart rate variability. And they overlay the data that is extracted from the video signal by the AI algorithm to see how close they are. So let's hope the video works. Okay, they're starting. And the black line is the oximeter reading. The brown line is the reading from the AI algorithm from the video. Look at how close they became. So what this is, is we now have a technology, and this is not the only one. MIT is working on a similar technology as well that we can process a person's video without any equipment on this person to extract heart rate and precision enough to extract heart rate variability information from just the video. Now, we can now look at this information and tell whether this person's had a, a transplant, whether this person is susceptible to a particular kind of um, disease that is studied in the bioscience community. Isn't that interesting? There are other things that we can process. So I'm not gonna show you a video here, but this, it was a video that I was shown. So they did the same thing to Mr. Trump's um, uh, presentation, and they were able to extract heart rates and pulse rates. Right? So, and, and I took a screenshot. Somewhere through the video, you can see the pulse rate at the bottom right there is going up like that. Now, this is purely from a video, right? So, is our president uh, uh, getting excited, or is he lying? All this information is from a video, like right? no um, equipment on him. So, that's the interesting part is now, of course, I'm saying this, but this algorithm is, is purposely designed for this, right? So you cannot take a video and, and feed into TensorFlow and get the same results, you, you can't. This is a proprietary, purposely designed algorithm to process this kind of information. But the high order bit is the technology exists today. Imagine that there's also literature on, on, on tying certain kind of heart rate variability to this uh, uh, the susception of, uh, of what's the word? Uh, if you are susceptible to seizure, right? Imagine that somebody sitting behind a camera can can process, use AI algorithm to know that you're susceptible to seizure. Imagine you're head of state or you CEO of a company, and imagine they will feed you a video that has certain frequency to trigger seizure. And this is entirely possible today with this kind of technology. So, coming back to application security. This is a, a price of vulnerability of zero days in 2017. Um, goes, uh, price goes up on a, a higher roll. The, the top one, there's a iPhone Zero day was sold for $1.5 million right, in 2017. So this is the price of zero days today for application vulnerabilities. Now my question for you is, how much would you pay for vulnerability indicators of human vulnerabilities, right? So are we, in a few years, are we going to be looking at same kind of data for sale on the underground market because AI has advanced enough to extract human vulnerability information. And imagine you're head of state, how much would that, how much would your vulnerability data cost? And this is not too far uh, from reality today. So trust is a very interesting thing for services needing to trust users. 
So we're looking at today, we, we can look at identities, we can look at facial structures, we can look at bio signals as, we just, as I just show you, you can do human computer interaction, and then a whole bunch of context. You more or less can get to the right answer, but can you get to the right level of trust as artificial intelligence advances? That's an interesting question to ask. So if you look at um, how close artificial intelligence is to passing the Turing test, uh, there are a number of different uh, tests we can do. First one is natural language processing. And then the complexity goes up from there. We, have, we can process, have the artificial intelligence process audio video data, um, some kind of it, phys, perform some kind of physical tasks, and process emotions. And in the end, I always think if there's one day an artificial intelligence is able to deceive us, is perform actual deception, then we're in trouble. So let's look at the progression of this, right? Not, in natural language processing, we are dangerously close to passing the Turing test. And I don't know how many of you have read this uh, uh, 2014 test on uh, Eugene Grossman, which is a chatbot uh, in, uh, I think, University of Leeds in um, uh, UK performed this test. And they had the chatbot, and they had thir uh, 100 some humans sitting in front of the computer and talking to the chatbot and going through certain you know, timed interaction, then at the end, they are um, asked the question, is this a human or is this a computer? So 33% of humans said, yep, I'm t I was talking to a human. So 33%, at that time, they declared Turing test has been broken, uh, but this result was disputed later because there are certain limitations of how, what you can ask, what question can ask, so it doesn't quite fit the complete Turing test. But the high order bit is we are dangerously close in natural language processing without any other t interaction being performed to be close to passing the Turing test. Um, everybody have seen this, right, CAPTCHA? But have you noticed that recently less and less websites ask you to put in CAPTCHA, but they are asking you to perform this, right? So why do you think they're moving from CAPTCHA to, to a check mark, say I'm not a robot? Does anybody know? What? So I can't hear very well, sorry. But the, the reason that is actually better is the computer has asked you to perform a physical task, which is move the mouse, to click in that box. And the speed at which you move the mouse, there's an AI algorithm sitting behind the service and say, hey, does that look like a human's moving? Or does that look like a computer's moving? So this is going from, you know, sort of a natural language processing type of interaction to performing a physical task, right? So again, we are going down the, we're going up the complexity ladder. Um, another thing I want to talk about in this general arena is have you heard of the concept of adversarial samples? Adversarial samples is a very interesting set of research in artificial intelligence. Basically says, can we find a particular set of data set that fools the algorithm into reaching a false conclusion? So this is actually a fairly famous paper from Google AI research, so you have a picture of a panda. Anybody can see it's a panda on the left side. And then they superimpose a vector image on top of the panda. And this vector image, of course, is purposely designed. And when you superimpose two images, you get a resulting image. To the naked eye, the rightmost image looks exactly like a panda to a human. To a computer, Computer classify this as a gibbon. Now, that's the differentiating conclusion 
by an AI algorithm and a human. So this example can be used in different things. It can actually differentiate between human and computer, which is a good thing, but can also be used to attack an AI algorithm is actually trying to, to reach a legitimate conclusion. So there are a bunch of adversarial samples that um, in the AI community, people are really interested in learning them. Another thing, I don't know if you've seen pictures like this. Does it look like 3D? This is actually in Kazakhstan. They have these, um, it's a flat picture. They print it and put on the road, but it looks exactly like 3D. And they made it to look like this. Now imagine you put this in front of a self-driving car. Right? So what is, what is the car going to do? What decision is the AI algorithm going to reach? And this is also another example of adversarial samples. So a question to tie this back to application security is, if you're an application security person and you're, the application you're trying to protect is an AI application, is testing against adversarial samples part of application security? Shouldn't that be part of penetration testing? Do we actually do that today? How do we test our algorithm so make sure it is robust against adversarial samples? My personal opinion is that is part of application security and we should start doing it. Beyond just vulnerabilities of specific lines of code. And as AI gets more and more sophisticated, today to reach a trust decision of service trusting user, you want to make a decision on a problem that is easy for human but difficult for computers. So that you can say, okay, I am talking to a human, not a bot. Um, but those problems are getting rare and rare to find because artificial intelligence is getting better computing resources are getting cheaper. So with that, who then can safeguard trust in the artificial intelligence area? I think we, as application security community, has a lot to play in this. Not only we're going to ensure the implementation of the algorithm is secure, has no bugs. We have to go up the stack and ensure the algorithm itself is robust, is, is robust against adversarial samples, is ro producing robust business outcomes in the way that not only guarantees precision, but also guarantees social fairness, maybe for some applications. So with that, this is my contact information. Uh, please send me an email if you're interested in learning